Amen. Good job. Happy anniversary to me. <laughs> uh, we had a great anniversary, by the way. I appreciate you all praying for us. Uh, my sons, Dean in Fort Collins, and his wife came, and Matt, and of course, our pastor and his wife, and we all met out at the cemetery. And thank you for praying for us. We had a very happy anniversary. I don't know how you can combine the two, but happiness and sadness was there. But uh, I appreciate our children. Uh, let me also say happy Thanksgiving to you. God bless you. This is going to be a special week, a special day. And I'm going to emphasize that, as I no doubt think the pastor probably will today. And uh, how many have got family coming in for the holidays? you got family coming in. Yeah, okay. That's a family time. And it makes it very tough on me because this happened to be my wife's very favorite holiday, even for far more than Christmas was. And, uh, and then Matt's going to be gone, so I can't have Thanksgiving with his family. My son Dean is going today after he preaches. He's leaving to St. Louis where his daughter, my granddaughter, Deanna, is, and she's giving birth to a baby uh, probably this week. So uh, his wife's already gone, so they're gone. So I don't have any family. Anybody want to invite me over? Uh, that, that, no, seriously, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drive to Oklahoma and be with my son, uh, be, uh, my son Charles, because he's going to be uh, celebrating not only Thanksgiving holiday, but their anniversary. So I'm going to be going there, Lord willing, uh, on Tuesday and be able to spend a couple of days there. But praise the Lord. Everybody doing okay? Good. Hey, by the way, I got some more. I got I brought some extra of those numerology. If you didn't get one, I've got them right here. If anybody needs one, you can uh, maybe either come and get them or pass them out. Somebody want to pass them out? Just raise your hand there if you didn't get one and you'd like to have a copy of that, okay? <clears throat> All right. Yes, you're welcome. Now, we're going to be looking at the book of Romans here to start us off. I'm going to just kind of talk to you from my heart, and so I probably will not get into any depth of, of any Bible study on today because of the emphasis of Thanksgiving that I want to give to you. But I want to give you some thoughts. I want to, be, I want to make us to be aware of the happenings that are happening both in Christians' lives, in the lives of churches, and of course our country, and seeing the progress that we're seeing of deterioration of both. Uh, thank you. The, the deterioration of both churches are deteriorating, Christians' lives are deteriorating in most part, and of course our country is in very bad shape. I want you to give close attention now to what I'm gonna show you here because I think you'll see the progression as to why we are in a condition we're in, both in the lives of God's people and his church and our country. And Paul addresses it. And I'm going to show you something here. And I want you to notice it very carefully because this is what happens. Then I want you to be aware that you don't allow it to happen to you. So let's watch and see what the Apostle Paul says, especially as we emphasize this Thanksgiving holiday. In Romans chapter 1, and you'll read in verse number 19, and it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest, or that which is known of God is revealed in them. In other words, God has revealed himself, for God hath showed it, it says in verse 19, has showed it unto them. So we have been, it's been revealed, the things that we need to know about God and, and to be able to praise him, to be thankful for him, to rejoice in our salvation, all the spiritual and Christian atmosphere that we have, those things are to be known by the Christian. And now watch, because I'm going to show you four things that brought us to the thing, place where we are right now. Watch this. Verse number 20 says, For the invisible things, and there are invisible things. In fact, we have the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit's here today. You don't see him, but he's real, but he's invisible. You cannot visualize a spirit. But for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world 
are clearly seen. Now, how are they clearly seen? They're clearly seen through the Scripture, through the eyes of somebody who's spiritual. We don't have the eyes physically to see them, but we have the spiritual eye to see them, and they're clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. All right, now let's stop there for a moment. Clearly seen, his eternal power and Godhead. For example, when it talks about the Godhead, the Godhead is made up of a triune God. There's only one God, but he's manifest in three persons. The three persons is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We see none of them. But he has manifested himself in different things. He's created, as it says there, that he's created so that we can know them. For example, ice, water, snow. Melt them all down. They're all the same thing. They will show to you the Trinity. All of them are the same thing. Ice water and snow are three things and God is a three-part being God the Father Son the Holy Spirit and so he's revealed to us his Trinity through that which he's created and that which he's created is snow water and ice and you see those three things here's another thing did God not make us in his likeness, in his image? So there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and he's made us in his likeness and his image. What are we made of? Body, soul, and spirit. We reveal God in the way he created us. We are a three-part being as he is a three-part being. All right, so this is what this is talking about, that in verse number 20, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power, the Holy Spirit, and Godhead, God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, so that they are without excuse. In other words, people are without excuse of knowing God because of the very thing that God has created reveals him and who he is even the three-part tri uh, 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 trinity. Now, but here's what I'm going to come to. I want you to notice carefully. In verse 21, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Now he's speaking to us. But because when they knew God, through the things that he created in the Godhead, and we're out with, without excuse, they glorified him not as God. Now, I'm going to tell you, most Christians know God. Of course, if they're Christians, they do know God, but they do not glorify him as God. They do not glorify God. They live lives that's pleasing to themselves and not pleasing to God. They do not glorify God. And the Bible says, in all things, give him glory. So everything is to be to glorify God. Now, here's where I want you to get to. The first thing then that we're coming to that is a progression of why we're in the condition we're in spiritually in our lives, in our church, and in our country is, number one, verse 21 says, because of ignorance, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, and so that's ignorance. We're ignorant in the fact that we do not glorify God because we do not know God according to what the scriptures say and we just let it we depend on the pastor to know God and the pastor to preach God but we ourselves personally don't receive that and glorify God in our lives on a daily basis so we're ignorant of the real truths that God would have us to glorify him in and so whatsoever things are true we're supposed to glorify him all right so number one is ignorance now watch this very carefully Look what else. it says. They glorify him not as God. Not only do we have ignorance there because when they knew God, but they don't acknowledge him, they're ignorant. They glorified him not as God. There's inconsistency. They glorified him not as God. Even though they knew him, they are inconsistent in glorifying him. Now, what is that going to produce? Watch this carefully. Verse 21. Neither were what class so when we're ignorant and are inconsistent 
we become with ingratitude. Neither were thankful. You know where we are as Christian lives today? Most of us are ignorant of the real truths of God, and we're inconsistent in glorifying God, and we are in gratitude. We are no longer thankful. Thankful. And what is ingratitude? I mean, everything that we are in this life and everything we are in our Christian realm ought to have thankfulness. And it says, neither were thankful. But now watch this. But became vain, which means proud and empty and lacking value. It says, became vain in their imaginations, in their thought lives, in their meditations, in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So that happens to Christians, that happens to churches, and it's happened to our country. But here's the worst thing, and I want to show it to you. When you have ignorance, inconsistency that produces ingratitude, guess what it's going to produce? Immorality. All starting with an I. Ignorance inconsistency, ingratitude, and immorality. Because look what happens. Verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Now, I'm not going to say a whole lot on that right there, but I'm going to tell you what that is or what could be applied there. Santa Claus. Verse 24, when a person becomes inconsistent, ignorant, and filled with ingratitude, they're going to have a Santa Claus that's going to be the one coming from the north where God lives and be the gift giver instead of God. <clears throat> and they're doing, they're doing an image uh, of an uncorruptible God into an image made like, to cor made like to corruptible man. He's a man, but he's made like the corruptible man. And to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And all of these things become more important to us than God himself. But here's where I wanted to go to. Watch this. Wherefore, in other words, because when you see the word wherefore, it's always referring to the therefore above you. Wherefore, God also gave them, that's the people who were ignorant, inconsistent, filled with ingratitude. Now he's going to give them up to immorality because it says God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped him and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. Immorality coming on, right? It's right. There's immorality. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. That's lesbianism. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and it really is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meet. I hope you're noticing something here. We are filled <clears throat> with a land that is absolutely immoral, both by women and men that have done this very thing. We got lesbianism and homosexualism that's rampant in our country. <clears throat> Where did it start? It started with, first of all, ignorance, becoming inconsistent, and ingratitude produced immorality. Neither were thankful produced what's following. Our country that was founded on the principles of the Word of God and on Christ himself Way back in 1776, when they honored God, honored his word, and founded our country, we have become ignorant of the Bible. We have become ignorant and inconsistent, and we are filled in this country with ingratitude. Inflation, oh yeah, but more than that, immorality. Immorality. 
<clears throat> Where to, what was the thing that produced immorality? There was a progression here. But the thing I want you to notice is that little phrase in verse 21 where it says, neither were thankful. From that place on is where the immorality comes. Americans have not been thankful for the heritage that we have been given in this country. The Constitution and the bylaws of the United, the Bill of Rights by the United States of America, we have not been thankful for what this country was founded on, and we have produced, because of ingratitude, immorality that's to the place right now it cannot even be controlled. And God gave them up, and he's given America up too. Would you like to see revival? No. I don't believe we're going to have revival. America has, I believe God could bring revival, but I don't believe the condition of the Christian lives and our churches are in a state of spirituality to be able to produce a revival. And we certainly don't have anybody in the leadership of our country as far as Congress and Senate and all the rest of it and president. We don't have anybody that's spiritual enough to produce revival. And so we're going to go all the way through this matter and look at what's happening in our country today, even with the, with the, with the economy, the inflation, and all that's going on. It's because neither were thankful. The ingratitude is produced, and with the, all the immorality that's going on. So I'm simply trying to get you to understand. By the way, if you'll drop down at verse number 29 or verse 28, and as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... The Bible's thrown out of the classroom of our public schools. The Bible's thrown out of our colleges and universities. The Bible's thrown out of our White House. We don't have a president who believes in the Bible. He doesn't believe in God. He's a Catholic, and we won't even, uh, he won't even honor what he calls himself to be, a Catholic. He won't even honor that. So I'm simply saying that they will, will not retain, and this is God saying, will not retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient. Watch what they are. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. Boy, that's America. Fornication. That's sex outside of marriage. Sexual things, not just, uh, just the act. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, Murder. Look what's going on in our courtrooms today. And look what's going on on our streets. Look what's happening in America. Murder, debate. <laughs> There's your lawyers and your judges and your attorneys that's debating. We just saw one take place here recently. And deceit and malignity and whisperers. Watch this. Backbiters. Here's the one. Haters of God. Yeah despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Is that going on today? Without understanding, covenant breakers. <laughs> yeah, I ran. Uh, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to the same, or only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. So where did all of that wicked, sinful, ungodly immorality come from? It started over there in verse number 21. Neither were thankful. In gratitude of being an American and being a United States of America citizen and taking for granted the things that God gave to us that were great in its founding as produced the ingratitude has produced the immorality, and that's where we are today. So I said all that to say this. What should we do then? We ought to make this holiday of Thanksgiving a very reverent. It's probably one of the greatest holidays that we'd ever celebrate, Thanksgiving, far even more far than Christmas. Christmas has become so commercialized, and I like Christmas. I like decorations. I like the music, but I think we have idolized some areas of the Christmas that are not, not intended for what God had in mind for us to celebrate his birth. So here we are. Now let me give you some thoughts to help us to get over this ingratitude that we may have in our own heart. You don't have to turn to it. 
and as you want to. But listen to these verses. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 and 20. Be filled with the Spirit, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Ephesians 5. Be filled with the Spirit. Verse 18, verse 20, giving thanks. Now, unless we're filled with the Spirit, we're not going to be thankful. Who produces the thankfulness to God? The Holy Spirit. Who lives in us? The Holy Spirit. What do we do when we quench Him? Then we start thinking of the ingratitude or the things that are, we're not thankful for. He's the one who gives us a thankful heart. Now watch this. Colossians 3, verse 17. If you want to return to it, you may, but here's what it says. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, in other words, what you say or what you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Giving thanks to God. That's thanksgiving. Whatever we do, whatever we think, Wherever we are, whoever we're with, God deserves thankfulness. We need to praise him and thank him for his goodness. Listen to Colossians. You're in Colossians chapter 3 there. Here's Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Continue. In other words, don't just let this week, this month, this year, let every day be a day of thanksgiving. Continue. Continue in prayer and thanksgiving. Continue on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Continue the next week and the next month and the next year. Continue in giving thanksgiving. Now look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 and 7. Philippians 4 verse 6, 7 says, Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, and we don't have peace of God in our country, but the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What will keep my heart and mind? What will give me peace of God? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Being thankful, and I'm telling you, one of the one of the things that we have, for example, today we're we got the condition of most Christians being uh, feeling sorry for themselves. You know, hey, by the way, self pity is a violation of the first commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And self pity is a violation. Here's something else. When you feel there's nothing to be thankful for, when you come to the place in your life where you feel like there's nothing to be thankful for, check your pulse. If you can feel your pulse, you got something to be thankful for. You're still living. And you can still honor God and serve God because you're alive. Our favorite attitude should be gratitude. Isn't that good? Our favorite attitude should be gratitude. Here's something. Gratitude to God should be as regular as our heartbeat. Every heartbeat. It's regular. And our gratitude to God should be as, gra uh, as regular as our heartbeat. He who forgets the language of gratitude can never be on speaking terms with happiness. How about this one? When a man has lost his gratitude, he's well nigh hopeless. When we've lost our gratitude, we're well nigh hopeless. Now, I'm going to turn to, uh, if I have time here in a moment, uh, over to Psalm 103, but listen to me while I'm turning over there. Thanksgiving, what we're celebrating this week, is definitely America's best holiday, and it's probably needed more now than when it was first established, but we don't have that in the most average Christian or average person's life in America. I believe it's closer to a Christian holiday than any other holiday of the year. <clears throat> More is said in the Bible about a heart giving thanks and praise than any other thing. 
And that's the thing that's lacking and the thing that's lost in our lives. And because it is Christian in its origin and practice, like everything else, it has been corrupted. Most Americans today, and I've heard it within the last few hours, most Americans today, and I hope a Christian never does it, refers to Thanksgiving Day as Turkey Day. That's wicked and vile and ungodly. I don't read anything in the Bible at all about the word turkey. But I can't hardly turn in the Bible without reading somewhere about thanks. It's not turkey day. In fact, if you have a turkey, you ought to thank God that you got a turkey to eat. But that's how we've, that's how we've degraded God. The biggest activity on that day on Thanksgiving Day will be gluttony and worship of sports and very little gratitude will be displayed on Thanksgiving Day. Very little gratitude. Now, I'm just preaching to me, okay, but I'm just telling you, we need to get back. You know what we used to, uh, I'm not telling you to do this or that you even do it or I'm not even saying a good example, but what we used to do before we'd sit down to our Thanksgiving meal with the family they would have had the morning while the meal is being prepared to have a list of things that they would read at their table, at their plate, before we even dished out the food of what they're thankful for. I had our children make out a list of things that they were thankful for, that they really were thankful to God for, or thankful to their parents for, or thankful to each other for. Make a list. Why? Because that's the day of gratitude. It's a day of thanksgiving. And list these things so that you'll be reminded of the things that you need to be thankful for. And before we'd ever eat the meal, we would listen to each other's list of gratitude. And you'd be amazed at how, much, how many tears were shed. Hmm. My wife and I, came from a state of poverty from the times when we were growing up. And sometimes we would have our list and we began to thank God for so many things. And when we come to the time where we would even thank the Lord for what was on our table. My wife and I, when we were first married, was so poor. I hate to admit this, but I'm going to. We weren't saved. But we would go up and down the streets and we would find, for example, a bakery truck. And when the bakery truck was being unloaded into a bakery and the man was out of the truck, we would go steal something because we had nothing to eat. We would steal something out of the bakery truck and run with it. And my wife and I would sit there and weep, first of all, because we did that, but second of all, because of what God had supplied for us. If we'd only knew him back then, he'd have probably still supplied for us. We didn't, we didn't have a turkey. In fact, the, our first Thanksgiving, my wife and I were out in the cold of Montana, walking in a field, looking. I had a little 22 rifle, and the 22 rifle was a single shot and didn't even have sights on it. And we were looking for a rabbit to shoot. And she was out there freezing in her, uh, she didn't have good shoes or big coat or anything like that. And finally, a rabbit did jump out and just by the act of God, I pointed at it because I didn't have sights on it and shot at it, and I got it. So we took it home, and I cleaned it, and that's what we had for our first Thanksgiving is we had fried rabbit. Don't you think we were thankful? And we'd sit around with a big old turkey with dressing and all of the trimmings. Thankful. And today is no different. I'm still thankful. I'm thankful that God saved me and gave me a heart that the littlest things in life. I opened up the refrigerator. I opened it up this morning to get out some cream to put in my coffee. And I saw some items in there and I thought, God, I'm thankful for everything that's in this refrigerator. I wouldn't have a thing if it wasn't for you. <clears throat> and I think sometimes we take all those things for granted. <clears throat> and we need to come back to the place where we're thankful. It appears, and this is, the, this is just Dean Miller talking right now, but it appears the more people have, the less thankful they are. I think 
when my wife and I started out our lives together and we didn't have anything and we began, after we got saved, being able to see God bless us, you know, that we had to be careful that we didn't become less thankful because God was blessing us. When people get saved, listen to this. For example, my wife and I, when we got saved, we were living, and I personally, my wife, not so much as I, were living in some deep sin of smoking, drinking, cussing, and all the rest. And, and in other words, Satan had a stranglehold on my life and was choking the life out of me. But I think after coming out of that kind of a background, that I'm more excited over the, the salvation than a lot of people are who was not living like that. And I'm, I'm not thinking that, that they're not saved or at all, but I'm just thinking that sometimes we that came out of a deep type of sinful lives were more thankful for knowing that we've been cleansed and washed and forgiven and we're heaven bound and we're more thankful for our salvation. And maybe that's the reason why we're more thankful for other things that God has given to us. And so uh, the thing about it is, after a few years, if we're not careful, the excitement of, of salvation even wears away. And we don't have the gratitude. We've heard great preachers. We've heard great sermons. We've, saw people, uh, we've seen people saved. We've seen people baptized. And then we become a little more like the world again. And it's not long. We're not excited or thankful for the salvation that we were when we were first saved. I'll never forget when I first realized after a preacher took me in the Bible and showed me that every sin I'd ever committed or ever would commit was forgiven and paid for by God. I can't tell you what that did for me. In fact, I can't tell you what that does for me right now. Having a past life that I have, to know that every sin I've ever committed or ever will commit, he paid for. You don't think I can be grateful for that? have the gratitude that, I deserve, that, I, that he deserves. So you better be thankful for the pit for which you have been dug. And if you're not thankful for the pit for what you've come out of, you're going to go back into the pit because that's what happens with ingratitude. We go back to the state of, of being in uh, immorality. And so we've got to be careful about that. Let me give you a couple of other things. I told you to go back over to uh, Psalms and 103. Here's what we need to do. I want you to see this in your own in your own Bible. Psalm 103, a very famous psalm for this. Now I want you to notice first of all what the, what the what the psalmist says. You know what he's saying right here? He is talking to himself. Have you ever talked to yourself? I do that all the time now that I'm alone. But when I go by my wife's picture, I talk to her and I talk to the Lord, and I talk to myself. And that's what the psalmist is doing here. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He's not saying bless the Lord to somebody else. He's talking to his own soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So I need to bless the Lord, my soul. i got to talk to my soul. And all that is within me, notice, not around me, but bless the Lord that, that's within me. Bless his holy name. Now watch, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know what the benefits are? Those are perks. Those are privileges. Don't forget, the, you know, I used to fly United Airlines a lot, and because I was a member of the United Airlines Flying Club, I used to get what they call perks. I would get certain uh, points, and I could use those points to be able to be upgraded to first class, or I could have the perks of going to what they call the red carpet room, or I'd have the perks of being able to use the points for maybe even meals. Those were all benefits for belonging to a certain club. Well, I got better benefits than that. Forget not all his benefits. In other words, God's given to me because... I'm joined to him and not a club. I'm joined to him, so I've got some perks. I've got some privileges. What are they? Look at verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. <clears throat> wow. Hey, for, that's a perk. I'm not going to forget the fact that he forgives all my sins. 
If I sin, which I do, and get on my knees and confess it, he washes me and cleanses me from every sin from that time on until I would commit another one and need to confess it and ask him for forgiveness. But he forgives me. Remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You've got to confess them first. He's paid for them. Confess them. He'll forgive them. And so if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That's why every day you can have a cleansing, a walk with God that's clean, because he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What a privilege. What a benefit. What a blessing. Oh, my soul, forgiveth all thine iniquities. Now, notice this, who healeth all thy diseases. He's either going to heal me the disease while I'm living, or he's going to heal me of the disease in death, because uh, there's not going to be any disease in heaven. But one way or another, either alive or dead, he's going to heal me of all my diseases. Thank the Lord. He's the great physician who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Boy, how many times have you gone down the street Somebody runs a red light, or somebody gets over in your lane, or you either are texting and doing something you shouldn't do and hit the borrow pit a little bit or, and all, but God allows you to bring back the car into safety so you don't have a wreck. He's redeemed your life from destruction. How many times have you been out there at work and there's danger everywhere that could have happened to you. You could have been hurt or killed or something. But he's delivered you from destruction. He redeemeth. That's what that's talking about. That's a benefit. He redeemeth thy life from destruction. And I need that and I pray for it. That's why the reason why when I'm going to Oklahoma this next week, I'm going to pray that God will <laughs> redeem my life because my eyesight's not as good as it used to be. In fact, I have cataracts and I need to get them off because at nighttime I can hardly see anything. You know, even with glasses, it's not, you know, but anyway, that's another thing. But I want him to redeem my life from destruction. Notice, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. What is a crown? Who gets crowns? Kings get crowns. What does God do? He's the king, but he, king, he crowns us. He makes us kings and queens, the Bible says in the book of Revelation. And what does he crown us with? What does he make us a king of? He crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. I went to the mailbox, and I was, I was crowned with somebody that had a tender mercy and loving kindness toward me and gave me a gift that came at the very right time. And I just picked it up today in the mailbox here at the church, and somebody in this room and somebody in this church crowned me by the act of God with loving kindness. And, of course, as it says there, tender mercies. And now watch verse 5, and I'm done. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. <laughs> yeah, sit there and look at that big old turkey. Satisfieth thy mouth with good things. What are the good things? Oh, my soul. Pumpkin pie with whipped cream. Is that not a good thing? Huh? And what kind of berries are those that we eat at the Thanksgiving time? Uh, cranberries, yeah, cranberry sauce, yeah. And how about sweet potatoes? Uh, sweet potato, oh, man. Satisfy thy mouth with, I'm watering them right now. Satisfy thy mouth with good, and I like pickles, and I like olives. I like all kinds of olives, green and black, and I like them stuffed with garlic or palmetto or whatever you call that stuff. I like, I like that kind of stuff. I like mashed potatoes and gravy. Don't you like that? You know, every morning, you know what I like? I get up myself and try. I'm not very good at it, but I'm learning. <clears throat> I like uh, eggs over easy. Mm, they taste good when you dip your toast into that soft yolk, and, and you know. And I like uh, those little sausages. What do you call them? What kind of sauce? No, I don't like the patties. I like the, oh, the links. I like the links. Yeah. Boy, I like them. I like them a little bit crisp. And then who wouldn't, who wouldn't like, I got to hurry up. Who wouldn't like uh, just to be able to have some good old 
potatoes fried. I mean, fried potatoes with those eggs, biscuits and toast. And anyway, God bless you. Let's have a good Thanksgiving. Let's not be ignorant. Let's not be inconsistent. Let's not be filled with ingratitude that we produce immorality. Amen. God bless you. Have a happy Thanksgiving.